Good morning, North Highland. They told me this is the service that all the pretty people came to. Do I hear an amen? And husbands, if you're sitting next to your wife and you didn't, amen, God help you. Amen. Now, how many of you are sitting next to somebody pretty? Okay, that was a little weak. Let's try it again. How many of you are sitting next to somebody pretty? Okay, I want you to look over at them and tell them, say, you're the best looking thing I've seen all day. Turn around and tell them that. Say, you're the best looking thing I've seen all day. I, husbands, I'm trying my best to keep you in good shape. I'm doing all I can. Well, it is great to be with you. We had a wonderful service, first service, and we're so grateful for what God's doing here at North Highland. It's always exciting to see what's happening here because God is doing some awesome things in this church. I love reading through the things of the mission of this church because you are a church on mission. But I'm going to tell you something. I've done this a long time done it a long time, and I've learned one thing. A church on mission can only be accomplished when you have a pastor on mission. And I am so thrilled with your pastors. You are blessed with pastors that are on mission. And you are, let them know it. You are blessed with your pastors. And when you have a pastor that's on mission, they're going to do things that keep things central on the theme of God, and you're seeing great things happen. I, I love the idea that you're going to feed your city. But here's what I learned. I learned that last Wednesday you had a lot of food and I wasn't invited. Then I heard her saying that you're going to feed the city and I wasn't invited. I've learned how this thing works around here. And I said, hey, come on now. I'm going, I, I want to come back to feed your city. I want to come to the missions thing last Wednesday night and see what happens. But I was here for Friday night. And Friday night, we had a wonderful time together. We had great food. In fact, let's just go ahead and say it. Welcome to Moe's. We had a great time. It was wonderful. But God has been good. You know, they always want me to introduce myself. Let me just put it this way. I'm from Billy. I'm from, my name is Billy. I'm from Georgia. And um, I believe that if anyone wants to go to heaven, you've got to go through Georgia first. Some of you need to amen that one. Come on. And I'm blessed. My wife is with me today. Valerie is here with us, and we're so thankful to have her with us. And she's traveling with me right now, and we're so grateful. But God is good. And some of you might know um, B.J. Thomas. If you look on page 20 of your guide, you'll see you got a couple of Thomases in there. B.J. Thomas is Billy Jr., and he is the Chi Alpha Director at the University of Georgia. And so um, right now we are very thankful for the University of Georgia uh, because last night God answered prayers. Folks, you don't understand. My office is in Missouri. They're all Mizzou people. And I walk around with a Georgia lanyard on with my tag, and I wear my Georgia garb, and I go in all Georgia. And as I was watching that game, when they made that first touchdown, I thought, Lord, I'm going to have to change my clothes. I said, I'm not going to be able to go back. Sure enough, they made the first touchdown, and I got a nasty text from somebody saying, oh, you've about to be done by the Mizzou. And I didn't answer back. I just prayed, Lord, let them die. Um, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I just wanted them hurt. Let me put it this way. You touch Georgia, you're touching God's country. Amen. So, okay. Now, how many of you can tell who my loyalty stays with? I'm there. I was born and raised in Kansas City, and so I'm a Chiefs fan on the professional side. So it was a bad week for me this week with them. And I haven't heard what they did today because they played at 930 this morning, and I said I was preaching, so I wasn't going to look. Valerie, don't look. I saw her grab her phone, and she was going to look. Don't, because I'll stop preaching to ask. But you know what? I found out a long time ago, when we get to heaven, there will be football. And the Bulldogs will never win. Let's pray. (laughs) The book of Ezra, chapter 7, if you would, please. I'm going to be just a few minutes with you. I want to share my heart today. I'm not a fancy preacher. I'm an old country preacher, if you really want to know the truth. And, um, and, and, and I want to share, I said this at first service. If anybody comes up and thinks I need money for a razor, I don't. Um, my dad passed away 34 years ago with prostate cancer. So every November, I do the No Shave November. The problem is I'm 60 years old, and I'm just hitting puberty. This is about a month's worth right here. And most of the people walk up to me and say, oh, do you need help? I'm not like your pastor who can grow a beard or where'd where'd Hardy go? My word, I was jealous of his mustache. I said, these people have got more mustache than I've ever dreamed of. 
And uh, so please, j please just deal with me that I'm trying to respect my father and understand him. The book of Ezra chapter 7, I'm going to read just two verses, 27 and 28. And I want you just to walk with me for just a minute. It says this, it says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king. Say, the heart of the king. To beautify the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love. Everybody say, steadfast love. Before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty officers, I took courage. Everybody say it. I took courage. For the hand of the Lord, the, my God, was on me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Father, let your word come alive in our hearts today. Help us to grow and know your word. Father, your word is all that matters today, and that is all we desire. And let us leave this place saying we were changed, not because of man's wisdom or man's knowledge, but because we heard from God. And we will give you praise, glory, and honor. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You know, as I look at the world today, those things that are going on around us, especially if I turn on the news, look at the newspapers, anything I do, I come to that conclusion, somebody needs to do something. Seems like everywhere we've gone, we've got a war, a rumor of war. We've got battles going on everywhere from the Congress to the White House to the Senate to the Israel to everywhere we look, and let's just leave it at that. I always come back to that same old thing saying, somebody's got to do something. It's that idea that we always want somebody that will step up, somebody that's going to rise up, somebody that's going to step into the place and saying, I'll be the one to stand up and accomplish those things. The problem we have as a people is that we don't like to ask that question when we're looking in the mirror. Because too often times if we're looking in the mirror and ask that question, we might hear God speak back to us and simply say, what about you? What about you doing something? You know, it's not us that really want to do something. We really want somebody else to do it, and we can come up with every excuse under the book. We can say we don't have the money, we don't have the talent, we don't have the ability, we don't have these things, we don't have this. But when we really, really come down to it, it's simply because we don't have the courage to do what God called us to do. That simply is the truth. Knowing that we've got the courage to do what God called us to do means that when we hear the voice of God, we respond and say, if he called me, he's going to make a way and I'm going to see this done. That idea of courage is a hard thing. Because he said in this when Ezra was talking, he said, I took courage for the hand of the Lord was on me. What he meant by that term was I took courage because I knew I was called of God. That idea of courage is a hard thing because it simply means to maintain composure and remain focused to the end. That idea of maintaining composure and remaining focused, I believe it was something that happened in generations that seemed to be passing us by. Generations that knew what it was to get a call from God and instead of saying, I'm just not going to respond or I don't have the ability to respond, they said, let me be the one to do what God called me to do. We're losing that generation if you really look at it because back in 2018 we lost Dr. Billy Graham and when we lost Billy Graham we lost one of the greatest soul winners this nation and this world has ever seen. Just a year later we lost Reinhard Bonnke, the great evangelist of Africa who literally saw more people saved than all of our churches put together in America will ever experience knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ. J.I. Packer, who always heard from God and wrote books that literally changed my life in 20. Morris Sorello, the great evangelist in 2020. In 2021, Louis Palau was gone. One who had heard from God and said, it doesn't matter what it costs me, I'm going to do what God called me to do. That idea of hearing from God, that idea of knowing the voice of God, that idea of knowing that you heard God is what matters the most. I'll never forget when Val and I had first moved to Georgia. We were living here in Georgia. And I have a habit that when I need to hear a word from God, she puts me in a closet and tells me that's your prayer closet. Usually it's the closet that needs cleaned. But this day I had told her I need to go to pray. I said, i got to hear from God. I need an answer. I don't know if you've ever been to that place. You just need to hear from God. She said, get in your closet and stay there. I think she locked the door. She was going to keep me in until it was clean or I'd prayed through one. 
and I got in my closet and I prayed. I come out of the closet later that morning and I and she said, Billy, did you hear from God? And I knew I better say yes or I'm going back in. And I said, yes, I heard from God. She said, what did he say? And we have this habit that we write it all down. If you ever hear from God, you need to write it down. You need to keep a diary. You need to keep a word there where you know what it is. And I wrote it down and it was just a list of numbers. She said, Billy, what is this? And, and I said, well, I don't think it's the lottery. He wouldn't give that to me. And I said, and I've prayed for it. No, um, but um, I said, I don't think that's what it is. And, and finally she said, Billy, it looks like a phone number. But we didn't recognize the number. I said, I, I don't know. I said, but what do you think? And she said, well, why don't you dial it and see what happens? All I could think was uh, the FBI has found me. And, I'll, and I was thinking, God, you're turning me in. What have I done? And notice she didn't say let her call. She said, you call. And so I thought, well, I might as well. I'm going to want to know. So I picked up the phone, and I, I held the phone out where we could both listen, and I dialed the number. It hadn't even rang a full ring. And I heard somebody pick up the phone and yell into the phone, Billy, how long does it take for you to hear from God and call that number? Grandma? My grandma Thomas had been moved to a nursing home on the other side of the state from Kansas to Missouri, and I did not know it. She was in bad health. They didn't have a phone in her room. She literally had gotten up and walked down because she said in prayer that morning, God had given her a word for me, and she didn't know how to get it to me. So she had walked down to the nurse's station, asked the nurse, what's the number to call that phone? The nurse had given her that number, and she began to pray and say, God, if you want me to give a word to Billy, give him this number and make him call, and I'm going to wait here till calls she said Billy I've been standing here for over five minutes waiting on you to hear from God how long is it going to take you to hear from God all of a sudden I said grandma what's up she read my book from one side down the other she began to prophesy she began to speak and then she said do you got it and I said I got it she said then get to work and do what God called you to do I got news for you right now. We're begging people to come back to the place that they hear the voice of God, that God begins to speak to them. It's not just coming to church. It's not just attending a convention. It's not just coming to a banquet. It's hearing God said it, thus saith the Lord, and doing as God has called you to do. If you're not careful, I'm about to preach. But sometimes we have a problem with this. Because it takes faith. And faith and promises are things that cannot be seen. And we have to trust God for all of it. We read a story and I read a simple text in verse, chapter, verses 27 and 28. I don't have time to go through the whole history this morning. But all of a sudden if you really realize what had happened, Israel had been in captivity. You could read about it in Jeremiah 25, 29, 2 Chronicles 36. You could read the whole story there. God had let them go into captivity because of them being against things that he had told them to do. And in that captivity, they had been sold over and over again. But he had prophesied, I'm going to let you be there for 70 years. At the end of 70 years, I'm going to do what I said I would do. I got news for you. I don't care how old you are, and I don't know why I'm saying this right now. I don't care how old you are, but I got a word for you right now. If God told you you're going to do it, you need to start rejoicing. It's going to happen because God's not finished till he does what he said said he would do but all of a sudden we see that Ezra had come to that place and Ezra was there and he was there and King Cyrus was there they had been in captivity for 70 years Cyrus then got word that his the 70 years was up and Cyrus being the half good king he was said hey listen if that's what God said then let's do it well, we see right there that Ezra was of the priestly house. He was working there in the, in the house with, uh, with Cyrus. And, and Cyrus said, hey, you know anything about this? He goes, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got you, man. Well, that's kind of how he said it. And then he said, I got you. And he said, I'll take care of this. So they put together a team to go down. They were going to go down and rebuild the temple. You say a team, yeah, 50,000 people were going to go down to rebuild the temple. And they were going to have to travel all the way. So they were going to go from Columbus. So they took Columbus up to Atlanta, got on a Delta flight, took the flight over. They relaxed. They all got their, their fresca and their little cookies on the Delta flight. 
some of you act like you've never been on a Delta flight. And they've got their fresca, their little cookies, and they sat back and they ate. No, they did not. The word says that they traveled over 900 miles by foot. They walked because there was a call of God to do something for the kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you this plainly and hear me now. If you get a call from God to do something for him, there is a cost to every call. There is a cost to every call. So they said that that group, 50,000 of them, traveled 900 miles. Now, Pastor Brad, I had to figure it out. I'm from Kansas City. That's where I was born and raised. Did you know from this church to my house and where my parents are at, it's 904 miles in Kansas City. How many of you would like to walk there with me today? Uh, not too many, I take it. Nobody wants to walk that far, but they had a call of God. And when there was a call of God and a promise from God, they said, thus saith the Lord, let's go. They took their families. They took their houses. They took everything. And away they went till they went to do what God called them to do. There comes a place in every one of our lives that God has said, are you going to do what I called you to do? Are you going to fulfill the promise that I said I would do? We struggle with this. Because we come back to saying all the excuses. Number one, we don't have the money. We can't do it. Number two, I, I, I don't know if God will actually come through for me. I'm here to rebuff this. For all of a sudden, Ezra sat there realizing, i got to travel all this way with all these people. And i got to go all the way down there. And we got to get through all the, the problems that we're going to face and all the combat that we're going to face. And we're going to have to rebuild this thing. And all of a sudden, he said, you know what? There was something he gave us in 27 and 28 that he said, I want you to understand something. He said, number one, you are going to have the favor of the king. He said, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who's put such a thing as this into the heart of the king. In other words, the one who had the key to the pop machine had their heart set on them. In other words, the one that had the ability to get it done was able to see that God had a call on his life. There comes a place in every one of our lives, and I want you to hear me on this first thing, that when we understand what the favor of the king is, it means that God is able to provide in ways that we never understood, and when we follow after him, he will do what we never thought possible to be done. All of a sudden, they realize it's going to take a lot of money. You know, I hear this all the time. I got, I got missionaries. I had a missionary call me last night. He said, I just need you to pray with me. I said, why? He said, because I can't get enough money raised. I can't get enough money raised. I said, are you concentrating on the money? He said, yeah. I said, that's your problem. He said, why? I said, concentrate on the God who has the money. He'll send it in. Don't worry about it. Start concentrating on the God who has the money, and you'll see what happens. He said, do you really believe that? I said, oh, yeah, I do. You see, one of my favorite people that work with us, and one of the jobs that I have is in my portfolio, is all the RVers. That's the people that travel around this nation building churches. Save the assemblies of God literally millions of dollars every year. Multiple millions of dollars. Why? Because we'll go in and build a church for free. Gateway Church, we work Gateway Church. We've done all these here. We did that one here in Columbus because they asked for an approval on a series of churches, and I look through my stack, and if they're in Georgia, they get immediately approved. <laughs> hey, listen, when the director's from Georgia, that's just what happens. But all of a sudden, I went to talk with one of my favorite people, and I was traveling out there to see him. And Bob and Karen Frank have been building churches. In fact, they have built over 30 projects in the last 20 years in Oregon, Washington, and southern northern California. They have gone through that whole area where there is so many unchurched people and people that are lost and dying, and they have worked so hard to build churches all through that area. But I sat down and I asked him, I said, how'd you do it? And Bob and Karen leaned back, and they gave me permission to tell their story. They said, Billy, I'll just be honest with you. said, we both work for Lighthouse Salad Dressing. How many of you know what Lighthouse Salad Dressing is? Anybody here? Light oh, oh, praise God. We're, you're from California? Well, it's here too. Trust me. And it's also going to be at the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. I've prayed about it. He promised. Blue cheese, Lighthouse Salad Dressing. That, I'm very picky on this one, but blue cheese, lighthouse salad dressing, it is of God. They both work for lighthouse salad dressing. They have some great jobs. 
In fact, um, Bob had actually designed one of the glasses, the glass that it comes in. He had designed that so that they could ship it better, and she was in quality control, and they had done really well. But the problem was they went to an Assembly God church, and there was a missionary there. All of a sudden, that missionary talked about the RV program. They went home that night and went to bed. And Bob got up the next morning, and he was sitting there and drinking coffee. And when she walked in and they got together the next morning, all of a sudden, Karen looked at Bob and said, Bob said, did God speak to you anything last night? And he goes, yeah. Did he you? And she goes, yeah. And he goes, I didn't want to have to tell you. She goes, what, that God said to quit our jobs and to just trust him and to go build churches for the kingdom of God? And he goes, how can we do it? And she said, I don't know. And so, you know, most people would say, well, let me plan on this and let me do a lot of thinking about this and, and years will pass and nothing will get done. Instead, they sat there at that kitchen table and wrote their letters of resignation, put it into one envelope and went and laid it on the human resource officer's desk. Lighthouse Cellar Dressing is a Christian-owned company. In fact, it's a family-owned company, and it's a good company. And you'll find out right now why I support Lighthouse Cellar Dressing so much. For all of a sudden, they've been on the job for about an hour. And Bob said, somebody came and said, hey, the owner wants to see you. And he walked in, and the owner said, Bob, we got these letters. What's going on? What happened? And Bob said, I looked at him, and I just did what I only knew how to do. He said, I looked at him and said, we went to church last night. God spoke to our heart and told us to quit and to go build churches for the kingdom of God. And he said, if God called us, we have to do what God called us to do. And the owner looked at him and said, do you have any money? He said, no, we're broke. He said, how are you going to do this? He said, I don't know. He said, we don't know how we're going to do this. All we know is we're going to trust God. The owner leaned back in his chair and kind of smiled, said, well, this could be a first. And Bob said, what, that somebody quit? He said, no, that Lighthouse Salad Dressing is going to pay someone for the rest of their life to go build churches for the kingdom of God. He said, Billy, he said, they literally paid my salary, my insurance, my benefits, everything for the rest of our time until I retired. And at retirement, they went on full retirement with Lighthouse Salad Dressing. Why? Because when there's a call on your life and you say, yes, Lord, I will do what you call me to do, he is willing and able to show the favor of God. He went on down, and I got to keep moving. But all of a sudden he said, he put that, and then he said, he extended to me his steadfast love. That steadfast love, if you really interpret it and go after it, you'll find out he's talking there about the anointing of God. He extended to him anointing. I think sometimes what we forget is that the anointing is the miraculous. It means God is going to do things that we'll never, ever understand. We can't figure it out. There's just no way. God has plans that are so much bigger than us. Get ready for this. When we walk in anointing, we have to understand that our plans are minuscule compared to God's plans. He has things so much bigger than what we could ever imagine that he has planned for your life and for you that you don't even understand what he's going to do. A couple years ago, I was asked to come down to South Texas to visit with one of our Spanish districts that they were churches were really needing help they were really struggling and having some struggles there I will never forget as I got down there I met a lady her name was Zilpa Zilpa Gutierrez and I she had started a church with her husband back in 2010 and I got there and I met with Zilpa and as I met with her I began to ask questions and she said can I show you the church we're at now and I said sure and they put me in a car and took me over and I had to wait till they had locked all the gates even to get out of the car because they had a building in the very worst part of South Texas. Zilpa looked at me for just a moment she said I got this building because someone had built it and then realized this is the area that all the gangs and the drugs and everything are going through and they're right on the border of Mexico and he said and she said no one would finish the building and nobody wanted it so they basically sold it to me for almost nothing saying if you want a church here you can have this. Zilpa then told me her story she said my husband and I were both here in the United States we had dual citizenship I was a bilingual teacher in the school making a great income my husband had a great job and people were coming over the border and they didn't know who Jesus was. She said, so we started fixing dinner at our house and they kept coming. And I'll never forget these words. She said, Brother Billy, do you know what happens when you tell people about Jesus? I said, what? And she said, they get saved. I said, wow, I'm from the national office. I never knew that. And she smiled at me and I'm joking on that. But she smiled and she said, so we started doing it and then we had to go to a hotel and then we were trying to feed them out in the tent and then 
this building came open and we said, okay, we're going to take a step of faith. And she said, my husband said, why don't you quit your job and you be the pastor because his job actually paid more and he could supply us and take care of the bills. Zilpa said, I quit my job in June when school was over and in December he died suddenly. I said, did you go get your job back? She said, why would I do that? The anointing of God had called us to do this. And if I believe in the anointing of God, I have to believe God's bigger than that. I was very amazed at her, and I'm going to cut a lot of the story for time's sake. But I looked at her and I said, Zilpa, what can I do for you? What can I do to help you? I wanted to do something nice for you. You know how you want to do something nice for people? I was hoping she was going to ask for a new book or maybe a pair of shoes or something cheap. And she looked at me and she said, I want one of those lighted signs out in front of our church. Those great big signs. And I wanted to say, you can meet Jesus here. So that all those people that are coming through here and all the people that are struggling will hear this. I told Val, I said, I don't know how we're going to do it. I started trying to raise the money, raised up about $3,000, and I'd ask her what she needed. They needed $10,000 for the sign. And um, I asked her what she had, and she had $25. Has no money. Came back here to Georgia. And I was taken off that Labor Day weekend. I think it was Labor Day or Memorial Day 1. I forget which one it was. I was taken off that holiday because I always take them off and rest. That's my day to rest. I preach almost every Sunday in a different state. And I'll never forget a friend of mine who has a little church here in Georgia called and said, hey, I know you're home. Why don't you come preach for me? And we were just talking. I said, okay, we'll drive over. I'm off. It'll be fun. We'll just give the week, you know. It's no problem. We got there at a Teen Challenge showed up that day, the Teen Challenge guys. And so grand total, there were 17 people there. It was a big church. He asked me to tell the story, and I told the story about Zilpa. After the service, this lady walks up to me. Now, understand, I come from Springville, Missouri. I was taken to South Texas. I then come back to Georgia. I'm asked to just come do this quick little service. And I'm praying all this time, God, how are you going to do this? And this lady, probably 35 years old, she was, she was way younger than me, walks up to me and Val after the service. She said, hey, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. She said, how much are you short on that sign you're going to do? And I said, we're, we're short 7000 But I said, um, you know, anything you can do, $25, $50, $100, $500, anything's great. And she said, well, no, if you don't mind, I just thought I'd give you the 7000 And I, I sat there and I said, what? And my mouth's hanging, you know, because I'm a man of faith. And my wife, and she said, well, if I had your address, I'd send you a money order tomorrow morning. So my wife is writing the address faster than I've ever seen anybody write in my life. She is writing that out quickly and giving it to her. And the, by the time we got home, there was a money order sitting in our mailbox for $7,000. How does anointing work? Anointing means that there's a touch of God upon it, that he can bring a guy from Springfield all the way to Texas to hear a story, to go back to Georgia to tell the story, to have a lady there who just happens to have $7,000 sitting in her bank, who just happens to want to put a sign up. And just a few months ago, Val and I went back down to Texas to dedicate a sign. And when I stood there and I looked up at that sign, Sister Zilpa had to come out because my Spanish is not real good. I know taco, enchilado, and burrito, and that's about it. And... and well, truthfully, that's all that matters. And, and I knew those words, but I didn't know what it was. And I said, Sister Zilba, what does it say? She said, oh, Brother Billy, it says you can meet Jesus here. And I said, how is it going? She said, we're having to go to two services now. She said, we're going to have to buy property. We're going to have to stretch it further. Why? Because those people who've been in the gangs and been on drugs and been causing trouble, they're coming across, getting saved, and people's lives are changed by the power of a living God. Ezra understood what it was to find favor. He understood what it was to find anointing. But he ended it by saying this. He gathered leading men to go with him. The third thing that you need to learn today is no mission, no kingdom builders is going to grow. God's kingdom needs partnership. 
Your pastor is awesome. We love your pastor. But he can't do it alone. Brother Gay is leading the kingdom builders and doing just a phenomenal job. But he can't do it alone. But it means there has to come a partnership of people to say, hey, you're not alone in this. I'm going to do it with you. That means we pray for them. We stand with them. But we support them. I told somebody one day, they, they were talking about living by faith, and I, I do a lot of training online, and I do a prayer time on Thursday nights with people, and I, I just do a lot of this. And one of my favorite sayings is that I'm not in this for the money, but without the money, I'm not in this. But then I come right back and I say this. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he has always been willing to butcher a few of them for me. And I come back to that with this. There comes a place that partnership means commitment. Commitment to the cause. Commitment to the path. Commitment to what we have to succeed in. And right now your pastor, your pastor, your leadership is laying out a plan that I'm going to invite you to say, hey, listen, I want to be like Ezra. I want thousands of years later when somebody's up talking about it, they say, hey, look, I was part of that because I partnered with it. Partnership. 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 I'm praying for this church right now. I'm praying for this church because when I started praying for this church, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, they got to stretch, and it's going to be a stretch for them, but it's going to be good. And I said, they got to have at least half a million dollars this year in Kingdom Builders. Now, now I'm leaving today, so you can't hurt me. Your pastor didn't say that, but I think he's all with me on this. But he didn't say it, so blame me for it, okay? And someone said half a million, and I was in my office the other day praying, and Val heard me, and they're praying. She came in and said, what's going on? I said, I'm praying for North Highland. I said, I'm believing God there's going to be a half a million dollars, faith promised, and given this year for kingdom builders. She said, Billy, that's a lot of money. Ah, no, it's not. God owns a lot of cattle. This is what I told her. I said, 200 families giving $2,500 this year would be a half a million dollars. You say $2,500, yeah, 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 that's $50 a week, that's a couple hundred dollars a month, that's giving up Starbucks. $50, that's about Starbucks now if you go. And it's saying, God, this is more important to me than anything else. So I ask this question. Who's going to be the next one to help put up a sign? Who's going to be the next one to help build a church here in Columbus? Who's going to be the next one to say, hey, I'll partner with you. And watch what North Highland can stand back and say, look what God has done. Imagine a table so full of chairs, it's overflowing in celebration. Imagine a feast so beautifully prepared, it's bursting with flavor. Imagine the king full of love and care, he saves a chair with your name on it. We have the honor of dining with the king, partaking and honoring the joy of his offering. This is what it means to have a seat at God's table to drink the wine of his blood and eat the flesh of his body, to join in the communion with holiness embodied. Jesus is the reason you and I have a seat saved. He's the reason, the motivation, he's the purpose and salvation. If Jesus is this good, then why do we feel the need to keep him to ourselves? 
The table is big enough. There's plenty of chairs for friends and for family, but it can't end there. Jesus says, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the handicapped, the lame, and the blind. Prepare the table for those who are lost and behind. Make room for the one who's alone in their plight. Pull out a chair for the hidden and lead the blind. See, this table wasn't made for just you and I. It was made infinitely with love in mind. Everyone deserves a seat. Everyone deserves his feast. Equally, peacefully, beautifully, and willingly. We'll dine with our Creator and make room for more. We'll revel in His glory all together with joy. So, my question for you, will you set the table? Will you help make the feast? Will you pull out the chair for others to eat? Will you be a kingdom builder? Well, the Lord is speaking to us today, amen? Will we become partners? On your, on the chair next to you, a couple different things. First of all, our Kingdom Builders Guide. I've got great news for 2023. We are on track in 2023 to fund 100% of our project guide. 100% of our projects filled. But it seems like the Holy Spirit talked to our speaker. Uh, we didn't even tell him that we, for 2024, are feeling like the Lord is asking us to stretch a little bit. We're doing something that we didn't do this year, but for next year, we want to do something new. We want to add more. We want to stretch and extend. We want to see the gospel be preached in our church, our city, in our world. And one of the things that we're doing is we are launching another new church plant in our city. Some of you know Pastor Juan and Mia Rodriguez. They've been doing a, a ministry here. But they came to me and they said, Pastor Brad, I feel like the Lord's calling us to pastor a church, a Spanish-speaking church here in our city, that that community needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Being a man of faith, I said, that sounds great. And then the practical side of Pastor Brad kicked in. The financial side of Pastor Brad kicked in. I thought, that's going to be expensive. But I met with John Gay, our Kingdom Builders coordinator, and I said, hey, man, is the Lord in this? What do you think? He goes, man, the Lord is in this thing. Let's plant another church. Some of you guys remember, we planted Gateway. <laughs> we planted Refuge. This church has a long and rich history of planting and mothering churches. I say, let's do it again. But but here's the deal. Yeah, let's do it again. But 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 this is in addition <laughs> to everything we did in 2022. So we're stretching. So will you stretch with us? Would you just say, you know what, I'm gonna extend with you. Uh, the second thing is this, you have a pledge form. And here's what I just want you to do. Would you just ask the Lord, how would you have me give? seems the math seems that if anybody lands views a family say yeah we want to you know land somewhere in that 200 250 dollar range of 200 of us do that we could get this thing taken care of some of you can do more some of you maybe do less but what if everyone did something the need will be taken care of here's what i want you to do i want you to just ask the lord we're going to give you a, about 30 seconds i'm asking you to do a dangerous thing Ask the Lord how much you should give. Let the Lord speak to you. However much he says, would you just pledge that? I'm going to pray and then I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. Lord, I pray that you speak to us today. Lord, the need is great. The need is too much for us. But Lord, it's not too much for you. So Lord, speak to us today. Lay a, a giving level on our heart and a commitment. Where are we going to commit to to see the kingdom of God be built? Speak to us today.
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you fill out that form, as you pray and listen, and probably talk to someone near you and get on the same page about being a kingdom builder for 2024. If you're done filling out your form, church, can you stand with me? A couple quick things. Number one, this is our project guide, but it's also your personal prayer guide. Would you take this as a gift just to remember? You say, I don't know what to pray for. Here's a great thing. A hundred missionaries, church plants, local nonprofits in our city that need your prayer and support. So number one, would you pray? Number two, would you drop this pledge form on your way out? There's buckets, there's tables back in the back with our giving bucket. Would you drop that on your way out? And finally, if you walked in here today and you say, Pastor Brad, I walked in today and I'm really far from God. Can I tell you something? That the Bible says that he stands at the door of our hearts and he is knocking. He just wants us to say, yes, Lord, come on in. If that's you, saying yes to Jesus today will be the best decision you ever make. If that's you, just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Today is your day of salvation. If that's you, we got a connect table in the back. Could you stop by there and let us know about your decision today? And before I bless you, church, could you put your hand on the on our Kingdom Builder Project Guide? It's a representation. We're going to pray for these people and these projects and this ministry. Lord Jesus, God, we lift up every missionary, every church plant, every project that needs funding. God, this booklet represents so many people who are committed to live on mission. So we support them. We pray that you would meet every need according to your goodness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God, I pray you'd bless your church. I pray you'd keep your church. I pray you'd make your face shine upon their church. I pray that you'd give every mom and dad and grandparent and child in the house today rest and peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And I pray that today, Lord, we become kingdom builders. We love you and we thank you. And everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless what you, North Highland. a great Highland. message we just got to listen to. Thank you again for choosing to tune into North Highland Church. I really hope to see you next week. Have a good one.